Welcome to the third and final installment of the Frontier Introduction Series featuring the Accelerator Underground Rare Processes and Precision and Theory Frontiers. This series is brought to you by the SNOMAS Early Career InReach Key Initiative led by Cindy Lin and Christian Herwig. Special thanks to Josh Barrow for hosting the Zoom Connection. My name is Tiffany Lewis and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Each Frontier will present for 15 minutes, followed by a five minute Q&A, during which you are encouraged to use the Zoom raise hand feature to bring up a question or a comment. You can also write your comments in the chat. We begin with the Accelerator Frontier represented by Tor Rogenheimer. Tor is a Frontier convener for the Accelerator Science. He is a professor of particle physics and astrophysics at Stanford University, as well as a physicist at Slack National Accelerator Lab having received his PhD from Stanford in 1991. Dr. Robenheimer for the Accelerator Frontier. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Um, uh, just, uh, you would ask me to show this um, welcome slide uh, talking about Zuma Geek. Uh, I will leave that up there for a second, but then um, move on. So as Tiffany mentioned, I'm gonna talk about the Accelerator Frontier um, one of the conveners along with Steve Gourlay and Vladimir Schultzep. Steve is at Berkeley, I'm at Slack, and Vladimir's at Fermilab. Um, the, the goals for the Accelerator Frontier are to understand along with the, the other frontiers what are the most important questions for the field. And then again, working with the other frontiers, identify promising opportunities and the tools to address them. And then what we really want to do from the Accelerator Frontier is provide the information to P5 on the technology and the, the scales and the, uh, uh, the risks associated with these technologies to help them develop a strategy for the U.S. to, to help them develop a strategy for the U.S. high energy physics program. And to that end, we have discussions that will be focused on high energy hadron and lepton colliders, uh, high intensity beams for neutrino research or for physics beyond colliders, there are, you know, there's a topical group focused on accelerator science education and outreach. And then there's, of course, the discussions of core accelerator technology, uh, including RF magnets, targets, and sources. Um, like all the other groups, uh, a lot of the information is available on the SIMLAS wiki pages. Uh, there is, uh, on there, of course, there is also a calendar that talks about the regular meetings and uh, what's happening when and where uh, for the different groups. And so you can get most of the information there. The biggest source of information will probably be the upcoming, um, and, and we'll have a, uh, a, uh, another Accelerator Frontier um, community-wide meeting in the beginning of September. The date is not yet set, but it'll probably be the 9th of September, I believe. Um, the biggest source of information will really be the uh, the community planning meeting coming up in October, where, of course, all the frontiers will be presenting, and then there will be breakouts for the different groups. And we're working on the detailed agenda for that. But I think that will be an opportunity for people to, to engage and learn about the different activities going on in all the different frontiers. In terms of topical groups, I, I talked briefly about this, but we have uh, seven topical groups um, and actually they kind of break out into 10 different groups. Uh, one is focused on fundamental beam physics and also on education. And so that's looking at, at issues that, for example, can one build a, a E plus E minus glider that reaches into uh, the 10 TV range or are you limited by fundamental processes uh, or synchrotron radiation? Another group that's focused on accelerator sources for neutrino physics. Um, Typically, these are very high power accelerators that deliver multi megawatt beams, which are then converted um, and are used for, for neutrino studies. Uh, there's a group focused on accelerators for, uh, for Higgs or electroweak. Um, and these are typically in the hundreds of GeV range, uh, center mass energies in the hundreds of GeV range. Um, but but not getting into the multi-TV range. And then there are a set of accelerators, there's a group focused on the energy frontier with multi-TV colliders. And whether that be a lepton collider uh, in the few to, to uh, uh, 10 TV or so, or whether it's a hadron collider at the, at the 100 TV. Um, uh, 
AF5 is focused on uh, accelerators uh, for uh, physics beyond colliders or rare processes. Um, frequently, these are looking at fixed target experiments, but there are other esoteric ideas that people have of doing things like creating positronium and trying to study that in perhaps a, a ring or something. Um, uh, group six is looking at advanced accelerator concepts. This is kind of a holdover name. Uh, many of the groups are looking at advanced accelerator concepts. Uh, but the AAC is a uh, phraseology that has been used to describe plasma and electric accelerators. And so this is really focused on looking at um, what one can do to use advanced acceleration concepts uh, to get up into the TV scale, uh, but very compactly. So with plasmas, for example, you can increase the acceleration gradient by a factor of a thousand. Uh, in concept, you could have a collider then that reaches a TeV that is, you know, easily fits on on the slack of the Fermilab site. Uh, there are other challenges associated with that, of course, and um, and so that group is focused on that. And then there's a group focused on uh, the primary issues associated with accelerator technology that that limit um, scaling up to some of the the, uh, the concepts that are being considered by uh, the AF2 through through AF4 mainly, uh, having to do with high power RF or magnets, very high field magnets, targets and, and particle sources. And as I said, the goal that we have is to working with the other frontiers is to understand the most important questions for the field and then figure out what opportunities and tools uh, one can think of to address them with the goal of providing information to P5. Now, to do that, uh, what we've requested each working group or each topical group to address, what accelerators and tools are needed to advance the physics, uh, what's currently available, state of the art in the world, what new facilities could be available in the next decade or, or more realistically, probably the next next decade, um, and what R&D would enable these future opportunities. And then what, something that's really important, what are the time and, and not costs because <laughs> We don't want to talk about dollars, but, but what are the scales of cost of the R&D to, to do the demonstrations necessary, as well as the time and the, the, the cost scale of the facility itself? Uh, I was involved with the Linear Collider Program for, I don't know, 20 years, and, uh, and saw what happens when you can quote, when you quote a cost that is, uh, in this case, just, you know, a factor of two too low. Uh, that actually led to a uh, huge fallout um, that, uh, that impacted the, the field significantly on the 2008 timescale. Um, and so for these very large projects, one, one needs to be careful not to, not to talk about dollars. Uh, something that's important is P5 will, will likely, I expect, recommend both a combination of, of large, mid and small scale projects to address the breadth of the physics. And of course, when thinking about the large scale, meaning many billions of dollar type uh, scale projects, time scale, uh, R&D, and staged approaches are important. Before one can talk about a 30 TV muon collider, you want to talk about how you're going to get there and probably something on a much more reasonable scale, whether that's at the, the few hundred GeV or the TV, I don't know, but that's something that people have to map out. And technology is key to any of these large scale projects. On, on the mid to small scale projects, these are driven by physics and the opportunities, both in terms of, of the physics, but also the facilities that are available and what uh, hardware has been developed and, and can be used uh, in this case. I'm working on a project where we're using some of the LHC detector electrons, and these are operating at 25 nanoseconds, and that suddenly allows us to do something that we weren't able to do otherwise by, by simply looking at what they do and, and using that as a spinoff. Um, some of the things that we're looking at, of course, these are all large projects, but there's the SPPS in, in, in China, there's the ILC uh, in Japan, there's of course the LHC at CERN or the FCC uh, at CERN. There's a Higgs factory, which uh, I throw out on the Fermilab site. Uh, that would be a wonderful opportunity if, if such a thing were, were reasonable. And that's something that we want to explore. And then there's things like plasma 
and those are just some of the possible uh, topic or some of the topics that we will be addressing. Um, just a few more statements. The muon collider. Um, one of the things about the muon collider, and this is a, a, a schematic of possible configurations for the muon collider that came from the CERN courier. Uh, there's a driver that generates a high intensity proton beam, or perhaps there's another way to generate the muons. Uh, front end cooling, uh, some of that can be uh, skipped if you, if you take this approach known as lemma, and people need to understand the, the feasibility of that. Uh, and then there's an acceleration process, and finally there's the collider, um, and understanding what are the limits that one can actually operate the collider ring is another important question for, for, the, uh, for the, the beam physics groups. One of the challenges with the, uh, the muon collider is understanding the details of the machine detector interface. So this is something that has to work on the, or an understanding of the detector and the abilities to resolve collisions, as well as understanding the machine and the backgrounds that come from the machine, the accelerator. So that, that's something that lives between the two, uh, between the, the physics and the accelerator working groups. Um, another example is the plasma collider. Uh, there's a sketch from a, a Physics Today article, uh, probably, probably actually a decade old at this point. Um, but, but as I mentioned, plasmas offer the possibility of gigavolts per meter acceleration gradients, something like a thousand times that of the convention. And uh, unfortunately, that, that sounds wonderful, but unfortunately, plasma colliders tend to have challenges with luminosity and generation of positrons. Uh, a plasma tends to is, is a signed um, uh, fluid, and positrons react very differently than electrons in a plasma. One of the big questions is, would be how to stage a plasma collider. Again, one can't talk about a multi-TV plasma collider before one starts to figure out what is the, an intermediate stage. And these are all questions that are being addressed at, uh, in the AF6. Uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting is thinking about the plasma collider as an afterburner for a conventional E plus E minus collider. And I think that will be studied in some detail. Uh, small projects, I mentioned small projects, most of the small projects are engaged with the AF5 topical group and the rare processes frontier, which I believe Bob will be talking about uh, subsequently. Um, but questions, are there compact fixed target experiments? What could be done with PIP2 at Fermilab along these lines? Uh, can one create a positron, positronium storage ring? How do you search for low mass dark matter? It's actually an experiment that I'm involved with, where we're taking the, a, an accelerator at SLAC uh, that was built for uh, photon science or basic energy sciences. So it's a billion dollar uh, uh, LINAC that accelerates the beam up to 4 GV. And we're using that parasitically. We're extracting out dark current, current that the FELs, the free electron lasers don't want. And we're gonna use that to try and search for low mass dark matter. The advantage of the small projects, of course, is that they're easier in terms of dollars, time scale, and the impact that any individual can have. And so that, especially as an early career member, can be, uh, can be quite exciting. And my guess is Bob will spend some time uh, talking about that. So as a final slide, um, why engage in the accelerator frontier? Or maybe it's a semi-final slide. Um, accelerators will likely be key to the next advance in HEP. Uh, accelerator technology has broad applications across science, not just high energy physics, but basic energy sciences or, or nuclear physics. Right, the next big project in the U.S., accelerator project in the U.S., is likely to be the, the, uh, the electron ion collider, uh, which is um, going to be situated at, at Brookhaven. Uh, it also has application in medicine and industry. Right? So the, the work that one does can, can frequently have very broad, and broad impact. Accelerator science is a broad field. It ranges from plumbing, um, which we all end up doing some of, uh, to chaos theory. Uh, there's material science and plasma physics. There's very little quantum physics, but, but there is a bunch of other physics. And so there's a, a fair amount of breadth there if you like working on different topics and, and are interested in, in having a, a broad range of, of work. And then there's the opportunity to work on tractable problems in small groups while building big. When I was a graduate student in the, in the uh, late 80s, um, I had a choice of joining a detector group, which I thought was large at the time, it was 150 people, or working on uh, building the accelerator. And I, I chose the latter. I, thought that I didn't want to be in a large collaboration. Of course, we all end up working in, in large collaborations, but it's 
just how you deal with your day to day. This is important. Um, so in terms of opportunities to engage, uh, one thing is to think of a measurement that needs a source um, or work on the machine detector interface, uh, which lies between the detector and the accelerators or work on the accelerator technology. Um, of course, the best way to engage and to find out what's of interest is to ask questions. Uh, join in some of the sessions during the, the community planning meeting or email uh, me, Steve, or Vladimir for more concrete ideas. And um, that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try and address them. It doesn't look like there are a lot of people here, so. Yeah, thanks so much for the talk. Hopefully the number of people will lend itself to some discussion. Uh, does anybody have any questions? You can go ahead and raise your hand through the Zoom feature. I have a question, though I can't raise my hand. Sure, uh, go ahead. Regard, regarding the, the plasma wake field, um, technologies that people are starting to pursue. Um, what, what particular institutions are dedicating themselves to that right now? And do you know kind of when the first real, uh, I guess, ring of that or linear collider of that may be actually instituted? Would it be the ILC perhaps or no? So I don't think that um, the ILC would go on a, a plasma direction, but I think one thing that one might look at is, can the ILC be upgraded from say 250 or, or GeV in the center of mass to a TV in the center of mass using a plasma? Sure. So that could be a really exciting opportunity to use the technologies that people are developing. And in the US, the, the two main centers that are, are focused on that are Berkeley, um, which is focused on using lasers to accelerate uh, uh, in a plasma to accelerate electrons. And Slack, which is using electrons to drive the plasma and then accelerate electrons or positive okay. charge. In, in Europe, there's also a, a large number of institutions working on it. Um, DAISY has a group, uh, CERN has a group, so that they're worldwide there, it's, it's a strong effort. One of the challenges that, or not challenges, but Plasma is interesting and for many reasons, and, and there's a lot of focus actually on a, an immediate step of how do you make a free electron laser with a plasma. And, uh, and so, there, you know, there's, again, multiple ways to engage there. Awesome. Um, Marlene has her hand up. Yes, um, it's not directly related to your talk, but something I would like to, uh, I would appreciate your opinion on. Um, we recently heard a couple of people saying that accelerator physics, especially young people, is getting out of fashion. That, you know, there's nothing really, that, like the interest um, generally from society or so seems to be decreasing and that demotivates a couple of young people. I just wanted to know if you have an opinion on that or how we could address that, how we could um, spark some interest. So I think there, I haven't seen a, a, a drop in, in interest, but I do think there's a change in focus. Um, and the focus is going more towards uh, things that have more immediate application. And that, that, that's a hard thing, right? I mean, uh, you have opportunities for people to develop ideas and, and see them implemented on free electron lasers. And, and I myself, as I said, I, had, I spent 30 years working on linear colliders. Um, but at some point, I jumped and started working on a free electron laser system because it was something that I could do now. And, and so that, that's a hard deal, right? Um, and, and same thing with the plasma acceleration. I think right now that the, the next big hurdle that people are focused on is how to generate a free electron laser. And of course, if one is able to do that, what you learn from that is, is key to actually making the next step and going up towards a plasma collider. You learn how to handle the emittance and deal with all the critical issues of stability and stuff like that. But uh, as a high energy physics uh, experimentalist um, interested in how you engage, that 
element of it may not be of as much immediate interest. And so I think there are opportunities to engage in the technology and, and um, both at Berkeley and at Slack, we have people looking at what to do uh, with plasmas. Um, we also, well, at, at Fermilab, of course, there's a very strong accelerator physics effort um, going on. Much of the other accelerator physics around the nation, HEP focused accelerator physics, has decreased. And, and a large part of that is funding, um, as, as you're probably aware, right? Uh, much of that is, is, is centered now at Fermilab, and so you don't see quite the breadth across the country that perhaps you did at one time. Did that answer your question at all, Marlene? Yes, thank you. Uh, just a little um, like semi-serious question. I didn't understand your reference um, from accelerator physics to plumbing. Could you elaborate on that? <laughs> well, I seem to spend a lot of time plumbing. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, you're worried about water flow and how to cool things. Oh, oh okay. You know, <laughs> dealing with energy density in, in components is actually, a, it's a critical limitation. And <laughs> okay. so, uh, you know, we, we worry and then, you know, okay, so, so water cooling isn't enough. And so then you worry about, you, oh, well, how do we use cryogenics? <laughs> so. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for the talk and the lively discussion. Next up, we'll hear from the Underground Frontier, represented by Jeter Hall. Uh, Jeter is a frontier convener for the Underground Facilities. He is also the director of research at Snow Lab. He previously worked at Fermilab on dark matter searches after receiving a PhD from the University of Utah in 2007. Dr. Hall for the Underground Frontier. Thank you. And thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Uh, Danielle, I know uh, you were just in the other talk, so you're going to see the same slides over again. But uh, No problem. <laughs> we just had a, a meeting uh, today, so I'm going to show you the slides that we showed in our first um, meeting on underground facilities and infrastructures with the co-convener group. Um, I wanted to say this group, uh, has the challenge of explaining why a hole in the ground is uh, an exciting thing to think about. Uh, so we're focused on underground facilities and infrastructure. Um, you can see the four uh, conveners here for this uh, frontier, um, this group, uh, Kevin Lesko from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, Laura Baudis from the University of Zurich, uh, John Arell from Pacific Northwest National Lab, and then, of course, I was already introduced. Okay, so um, we've split the underground facilities uh, and infrastructure up into these six groups here. So we'll spend a little bit of time um, discussing this. Now, uh, Historically, we've seen, and, and we're assuming, at least for the next 10 years, we've seen um, most of the underground facilities for high energy physics uh, focused on studying the nature of the neutrino and studying the nature of dark matter. And so we see very strong ties to the neutrino frontier and the cosmic frontier. We believe that the scientific motivations for creating huge holes in the ground uh, are coming from these two frontiers. Um, for example, on the neutrino side, we have, of course, underground detectors um, that have been uh, successfully studying uh, neutrino oscillations from atmospheric neutrinos, solar neutrinos, um, accelerators as well uh, in the underground environment. Um, and uh, all of these experiments uh, are at the cutting edge of, of understanding the nature of the neutrino. Uh, an experiment like Dune, uh, we see that as a, a really interesting challenge and something that, that we need to, to directly target um, in this underground facilities because of uh, interesting topics like cryogenics. So trying to get 10 kilotons of liquid argon uh, 
a kilometer underground is uh, a challenge. Um, just trying to deliver that much cooling power um, to that argon. Um, and so I think there's an interesting, the last time I looked at Dune, there's this interesting concept of cooling the gases at the, on the surface, bringing down cold gas and then um, ac actually condensing the gas into liquid underground. And so trying to tie in those facilities, we think will be uh, important in understanding some of the large requirements in the field moving forward. Um, additionally, we have neutrinoless uh, double beta decay. Now this one is typically, you know, there's some political, uh, political ideas around this, but this is also important for us to capture in underground physics because there are large um, requirements coming from this field and there could be interactions with the high energy physics that we want to do. Plus, um, it's really cool physics and uh, understanding uh, the hierarchy, uh, the mass hierarchy of neutrinos is, is a shared priority for both nuclear and high energy physics, for example. Um, and so Danielle uh, uh, is helping us with that as well. Um, let's see here. It, it, it's interesting, some of these big detectors, you know, they have um, a broad swath of physics that they're able to do in the neutrino frontier, uh, looking at um, uh, uh, neutrinos from things like the sun, the earth, reactors, uh, uh, black holes, um, and accelerators. These all come with different requirements and very different energy scales. And so there, there are many different requirements along the way. Um, studying GeV neutrinos, you don't need to uh, understand the argon-39 in your detector, but once you start to look at supernovae, you know, that might become important. And so there, there are these different requirements coming in that we at least need to understand and capture within the frontier. Similarly, for the, the cosmic frontier, there, there are a number of different um, uh, uh, searches even within the dark matter field that we think will bring their own challenges. Um, you know, for, for, well, back when I was a graduate student, I was taught to say that dark matter is, is uh, a likely candidate would be the neutralino and uh, its likely mass is 100 GeV. Um, that's still a very good motivation. Um, it has expanded since I was a graduate student, but um, things like uh, liquid xenon detectors, liquid argon detectors, they're, they're competing um, synergistically to search for this 100 GeV type dark matter. There's also been recently um, at the Department of Energy and across uh, the research community interest in low mass dark matter and trying to, to come up with technologies that can go down to very low masses and interactions, including both accelerators that were just mentioned, um, as well as uh, very sensitive cryogenic detectors um, deep underground. And these detectors, um, so this goes a little bit into to the, the UFO3. Uh, these detectors are at very low energies and they're typically based on superconducting electronics. Um, and as they, as they try to go to lower energies, they're looking to go to lower densities of quasi particles within the superconducting films on the surface of these detectors that couple to the energy. Um, this is actually fairly well aligned with quantum information science and the, the field of superconducting electronics because as they try to you know, improve, improve the performance of their devices, they also want to drive the density of quasi-particles down low. Um, so th this moves us from ionizing radiation to Cooper pair breaking radiation um, in terms of energy scales and it's about a factor of uh, 10 to the 3. Um, so there's some interesting requirements there in terms of vibration, infrared radiation, lots of, lots of uh, new topics and requirements that they'll need for these environments for some of these low mass dark matter searches. Okay, and that's why you see a, a tie-in with instrumentation there as well. Okay, and there, there are many other underground detectors. Um, so, you know, the, the gravitational wave folks have contacted us a little bit. They're very interested in um, developing some of their concepts or at least, you know, getting a mention of some of their concepts for the next generation where they can see all of the black hole mergers. Uh, and then um, some of the supporting capabilities, and this is where, you know, there's actually a pretty heavy load on the underground infrastructure in terms of understanding radon and building up uh, uh, facilities to mitigate radon. Um, noble gases are, are very difficult uh, to control. 
And radon is, is very annoying because it has this half-life of four days. So it, it gets everywhere in that four days. And then it turns into annoying things like lead 210 uh, that has a 20-year half-life. And if that interferes with your detector and the physics you're trying to do, you're, you can't wait that out. Um, uh, it, it turns into things like polonium that just seems to stick to everything uh, and cause backgrounds to many experiments. Uh, cleanliness and clean uh, assembly is obviously critical when you're in a hole in the dirt and you can't have any dirt in your detector. Um, and then of course low background assay is easier underground. So once you have these labs underground, then it's typically easier for large bulk materials to measure things like uh, uh, uranium, thorium, and potassium are, are typical examples of the backgrounds that we would be looking for underground. There's a lot of synergistic research, um, and, and so we wanted to point that out, uh, particularly the quantum sciences that I've already mentioned, but also some of the microbiology, um, studying the origins of the earth and the origins of life. These are, are, are enabled with some of these deep underground studies, um, and we wanted to point that out. And, th and that and all of that leads into sort of a, an interesting challenge that we have set for ourselves and we're set by the, uh, uh, the organizers of SNOMAS is to, to sort of bring this all together into an integrated strategy for underground facilities and infrastructure. Um, this is a, an interesting challenge and this would be really building on the 2013 underground facility report and recommendations. So, uh, sorry. Does somebody have the time? I just get lost when I'm in a Zoom call these days. I, I just want to make sure I'm not going totally over time. You have several more minutes. Thank you. Um, so last time we did this uh, snow mass exercise, there was a report and recommendations, uh, and, and you can see the archive link there. Uh, it was about 15 pages, and, and this is something of, of a starting point. So you can see the, the recommendations there. I won't, I won't read them to you, but uh, some of those have, have certainly been realized. The LBNE LB experiment is, is located underground uh, with the, the dune infrastructure. Um, uh, SURF is uh, an amazing place to do science in the United States. Um, giving it a leading role in dark matter and, and neutrino physics. Um, so, uh, and also pointing out the coordination. So, you know, there's a, a full science program and um, there are a number of underground laboratories and, and we think uh, diversity in location uh, is an important thing. And it's also important to bring those international partners along, especially in a, a time like this when uh, nationalization is probably uh, increasing within politics right now. I think uh, the internationalization of science has traditionally been very powerful um, in helping us understand nature better. So we still think that'll be important and important to point out in this particular report. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, there are some details. I, I won't read these to you in terms of, of what is going to be reported, but um, in terms of the, the focus of the group, so we're really, as I said, trying to understand current and planned underground facilities. We're a bit behind some of the scientific frontiers <clears throat> because as I said, we, we see the motivation coming from those scientific frontiers. Um, you know, we're not motivated to go underground. In fact, it's, it's actually hard work. Um, so uh, understanding those science motivations, um, being at that, that cutting edge is really the starting point for then developing these requirements and, and needed supporting capabilities. Uh, we we want to look across the sciences. Uh, there's certainly a, a strong partnership underground between high energy physics and nuclear physics in the DOE lingo. Um, and uh, uh, we think there, there are synergies amongst a bunch of sciences and we want to point that out. Um, we want to develop relationships between the experiments during this. You know, this is a community building exercise and we do want to bring the community together so they can see if they have um, uh, uh, infrastructure that they can reuse in a, a, a way that, you know, perhaps somebody's experiment would be uh, five million dollars if they wanted to build it from scratch, even if the hole in the ground existed but perhaps they can use somebody's infrastructure and deploy their experiment for ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, um, which would be a huge leap in moving some of these projects forward. 
Um, and and we're, we're also looking for, I think, um, you know, we have a good number of people now. And one of the things we want to look for the, the new and upcoming sciences, anything that, uh, that we're missing. And so we certainly want to capture those as well. So any R&D, growth of new technologies, growth of new sciences, somebody's got a really cool idea to detect uh, the cosmological neutrinos, um, something like this. So, and again, hopefully at the end, we create this vision for underground facilities to show uh, the exciting science that's going to be all concentrated underground and, you know, some of the, the um, exciting technical challenges to, make, to realize those experiments. So thank you. Do you have questions? Yeah, thanks for the talk. Does anybody have any questions? So I have one to get us started. Could you share your opinion on the value of early career people in particular spending time on the snow mass process as opposed to like their usual research pursuits? Yeah, um, in general or for the underground facilities in specific? Um, so I, I would say in general, I, I think it's important to understand me personally, I, I've spent some time working in the United States government. So as somebody who funds research and development, um, I, I've always found it interesting to understand everything. And one of those is how the whole, uh, scientific enterprise exists, is funded. Um, and, and moves forward in terms of that connection to, in the U.S. to the to the U.S. Congress and their appropriations process, and, and back to and ultimately back to the U.S. people and um, uh, the priorities that they ask their government uh, to impose upon the appropriations process. I, I think that's fascinating. Maybe I'm kind of a geek that way. I don't know. Um, but, but I think it is important to, to remember that connection to, um, between the research community, uh, the government and the American public. Uh, um, and, and I think this is a critical part of it. Uh, another critical piece of this, um, that's maybe a li little less esoteric and a little less, uh, policy wonky is that this is even in this environment, especially if, if you find a topic where you think you can contribute a few pages, uh, a, an idea, um, it's a great way to network. Um, that's, you know, one of the key things that I see from the snowmass process and all of this work and all of these people that we uh, assemble is to really get the people talking together, building that community so that you know the different people, you know the expertise they have, you can see them as accessible. And so that's why I would encourage you to reach out. Um, sometimes we're a bit slow in reaching back, especially during this pandemic, as we're all trying to figure out our work-life pandemic balance and you know, send our kids back to school next week or in two weeks here. Um, but, uh, but I think that's an important piece and, and communicating with each other uh, between some of the people, senior people in the field, the mid-career people in the field, and the early career people in the field, um, developing those connections, you know, that, that can be, you know, uh, if we get down to pocketbook issues, that's a great way to find your next job, for example. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, I I... Oh, go ahead. Okay, if, you, if there was someone else. Uh, if not, uh, I was wondering what the, what the next big hole is going to be beyond, Ooh. beyond Dune. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Uh, so I think, well, it'll be driven by the science, uh, is, is one easy answer. Um, but, but it's an interesting question. And I think, you know, that's one reason that I think the gravity waves are there. One could see with the success of the gravitational wave experiments that although it's not high energy physics and my personal love for dark matter, I think that's amazing science and it's probably well motivated to look at building one of these, you know, very expensive, very large gravitational wave detectors. I could see that being 
uh, there. And, and they're talking about 10 or tens of kilometers for those, those systems. And so those are very, very large holes in the ground. Uh, on the accelerator side, uh, one could see um, uh, something like uh, the FCC or some of these big colliders coming in. Um, I know CERN wants to start digging right away a massive hole in the ground for the next generation high energy collider as well. So there are some interesting opportunities for some massive underground developments. Um, yeah. Awesome. Maria? Uh, yes, thank you. So I, I just see the presentation very focused on facilities and infrastructure. But I just want to ask, like, related to, you know, personal, like, postdoc, grad students that will go for those mines and work in these holes, like, working condition, is this a thing that it will, also be, will be bring by this group? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that uh, health and safety is, is certainly, at, at all of the underground facilities, is the number one priority. Um, and so we certainly um, prioritize that. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. Usually they're off in, um, well, near old mines, for example, or they're, they're built off of tunnels that go through mountains. So those are the two places that we've put underground labs. Um, there, so for something it, well, I, I'm not sure if you're asking about air quality and things like that, just basic survivability underground. Of course, that's very important. Um, and it's important, well, for, for any underground work. Typically, most countries have very strict rules on working underground and what the environments have to be like. Typically, the laboratories exceed those. So, for example, at, at some place like Snow Lab and, and Surf, you have actual flush toilets, where most underground workers do not have flush toilets. Um, so we do try to put a, a little bit of extra effort into the, uh, the, the working environment for things like that. We also have uh, microwaves underground. We have coffee, which I, I probably wouldn't have survived last week if I didn't have coffee when I went underground. Um, these days with, uh, with the pandemic, it's been an interesting challenge. Um, for the most part, it, it's a very safe environment. We feel it's, it's fairly low risk right now. Um, but for, uh, for our particular mine, for example, we have a problem with uh, access uh, to the mine because everyone gets on this cage and miners are very cost efficient. So previous to this pandemic, uh, the concept was to shove 40 people into this cage. So they're, they're smashed together, literally. Um, that has reduced significantly um, to, to recognize uh, the risk posed with doing such an activity. But um, uh, it's led to less efficient work, so you may have to spend a little more time uh, working underground. But that, I think usually people really enjoy it, but there's a, a subset of people, if you're claustrophobic, um, it, uh, if you have problems with pressure changes sometimes, uh, these are things where, where we would recognize that and try to accommodate those issues with working in the underground environment. I see. Thank you. Thanks so much for the talk and for the discussion. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Joshua Barrow and Robert Bernstein representing the Rare Processes and Precision Frontier. Joshua is a PhD candidate at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and a visiting scientist at Fermilab. Bob is a frontier convener for the Rare Processes and Precision Measurements. He's a scientist at Fermilab working on muon to electron conversion experiments having received his PhD in physics from the University of Chicago in 1984. Additionally, he returned to earn his MBA in 2006, Dr. Bernstein and Josh Barrow for the Rare Processes and Precision Frontier. Hi, um, I wish I hadn't said when I got my PhD, now I feel even older. Um, thanks for inviting me. So I'm also the person who does the email lists and the Slack workspace for Snowmass. Bob, sorry, oh, I need to share my screen. Yeah. yeah. No. I, oh, are you? We can. Are you going to go first? I thought I was going to go. First. No, no, no. You go. You go. You're. You're the. No, I wanted to talk for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, one thing I'd like to know is like who I'm talking to. So this makes more work for Josh, 
but could everybody who's working in neutrinos raise their hand and then we'll put them down later? Because I already know the muon people. Okay, so that's that's four I see. It looks like one person's, well, that looks like five, it looks like I see a DE, I see that an icon is DES, so I'm guessing that. Uh, how many people are working in Cosmic? Okay, how many of you are working in uh, Collider? Nobody, interesting, okay. I know all the Muon people. Um, yeah, okay, cool, all right. So let me, um, let me get my talk started, that'll, that'll help me tune things. Okay, so are you seeing the screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So um, I'll talk about the rare and precision frontier and then, and then Josh will come on. Why is this not working? Worked yesterday. Maybe, are you, have you clicked? Yes. Worked just fine yesterday. I can maybe try to share it from my screen. Let's let's see if I can get this working. Yeah, why don't you try to something's gone wrong? Why don't you try to share it from your screen? Sure. Um okay. Sorry, one second. Of course, the, te the technical difficulties happen to the people who are setting up the meeting. Okay. Let me try, let me, or I'll try to reboot it and see if it works the second time. Ah, oh, now it works. Okay, never mind. Got it working. Okay, so everybody can see the second slide, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So what's SNOMAS about? So this is really an opportunity to look across the whole field, not just what you're doing, um, but what everybody's doing. And, you know, because you're doing die Higgs or, or looking at, you know, sine beta 1, 3 right now, it doesn't mean you can't be doing electric dipole moments in five years. So you should go into SNOMAS with that attitude. Because early career is really as much about learning skills and ways to think as it is about getting you know, domain knowledge in some particular experiment. Um, I was the Fermilab Wilson chair for years. And we always credited people who switched fields. You know, if, if they, people moved from, from neutrinos to muons or from colliders to dark energy, you know, we gave them credit for taking a, <clears throat> for taking a chance, for doing something new. And so that's not a bad thing. Um, yeah, it's a little bit upsetting when you first do it because you're suddenly new again, but you get to grow that way. So SNOMAS is, is good for that. It's a way to get a big picture and see what sparks your interest. So rare and precision, um, that's a kind of a weird name because everybody wants to look for rare things and do precise measurements. But as an experimenter, this process to me is all about you know, high intensity beams for targeted experiments with specific goals. And, and that's what distinguishes this intellectually maybe. Now that's a little bit fuzzy because you know we do experiments at LHCB, which is a general purpose experiment, but we also do very precise small scale experiments like anti-gravity experiments but I think they all share that sort of quality. The other thing is about our field, our frontier is that all the experiments are interlinked. I mean, there used to be this analogy at the last snow mass 
that, that the collider experiments, you know, if you got a present, right, the collider experiments, you'd open the box and see what was inside. And in this frontier, you had to shake the box and listen and try to infer what it was. Um, that's still true to some extent. So a lot of our field, a lot of our physics requires multiple experiments, multiple measurements. Um, so dark matter, and some of them are dark matter and accelerators, charge lepton flavor violation, baryon lepton number violation, CKM unitarity, lepton non-universality, EDMs, and disentangling complicated QCD states. And all of these gets related to each other. So you're not finding one new thing, although what you find may be very, may be very exciting, but it's always part of some bigger intellectual picture, which is what I like about working in this frontier. So, you know, typical experiments, right? And it's not complete, it's indicative. So our frontiers are, are one is weak decays of B and C, which are the CKM triangle, um, rare B decays, like beta S gamma is this incredibly important process about supersymmetry, right? Which a lot of collider people don't know about if they're working on CMS or Atlas because it's on LHCB. Um, and that's the kind of barrier Snowmass is about breaking down. Uh, the second frontier is weak decays of strange and like quarks. So things like CP violation. So I did my thesis on CP violation in the K-Long system. Um, and it just keeps coming up in other ways. I learned a whole bunch of things there. Uh, the third frontier is baryon and lepton number violation. So that's more than just proton decay, right? It's NN bar oscillations. We're sharing neutrino as double beta decay with neutrinos, lots of other processes. Four is, is sort of what you might think is, is this frontier. It's precision physics, smaller experiments, um, G minus two, electric dipole moments. There's a whole new subfield going on, which snow mass might push. Right? I'm doing, I mean, usually if I say I'm going to do an EDM experiment, you're thinking of some tabletop. But EDMs can also get done in accelerators. And so people are starting to think about that seriously. Uh, field five is, which is what I do, is charge lepton flavor violation. So I prefer to think of neutrino oscillations, although I did neutrinos for 25 years. Right now I think of neutrino oscillations as a neutral lepton flavor violation. And it's not just a joke, those things are related to each other. Um, so mu to E gamma is the canonical process, but mu to three electrons, uh, mu onto electron conversion, which a number of people on the, the Zoom line are doing along with me. Uh, but there's also tau to mu gamma colliders. Um, there's possibly E tau, E nucleon to tau nucleon at the EIC. Um, there's muonium, anti-muonium oscillation. There's just a lot of physics there. There's dark sector at high intensity. So there's, there's Taurus experiment, um, which is, there's a whole bunch of styles of that. There's missing matter experiments. There's beamed up experiments. There's um, long lived searches. So looking for very long lived dark matter particles. And you know, if you're doing a neutrino experiment and you're looking at uh, neutral heavy leptons or maybe Majoranas, you're tied into that. And then we have another group on hadron spectroscopy. So like things like, you know, glue balls are always, always the thing I find most interesting, you know, glue glue bound states. So those are the sorts of things that we do. So um, if you want to find out more, the three co-conveners are Marina Artuso, uh, who's an experimenter working at Syracuse on LHCB, Alexei Petrov, a theorist at Wayne State, who's written lots and lots of papers on many of these things, and there's me. And then the topical groups down here Right, here are the conveners. And then there's Slack channels and there's mailing lists. There's a frontier calendar there you can click on and go to that. But basically, if you wanna, if you're curious about anything, just give us one of us an email or a Slack DM um, and we'll get back to you. So we also have a pretty extensive system of liaisons. So we talked to all the other frontiers um, and there's a list of our, our, our conveners um, Sophie Middleton, who's on this call, is our community engagement frontier. Um, your, your conveners, your liaisons are Josh Farrow and, and Jake Bennett. Um, and, you know, get in touch with any of these people. 
So one of the big issues, um, well, you know, PIP2 is getting built in Fermilab. So there's a whole bunch of LOIs coming in on charge up time labor violation in the muon system, possibly on EDMs. Um, the JEP and RedTop experiments are talking about CP in the ADA system. There's a vibrant frontier on accelerator-based high-intensity drug matter experiments. As I said before, there's barrier on lepton violation outside of proton decay. There's lepton universality. There's all these weird B anomalies that are going on at LHCB. Um, but really, you know, and this is response in part to a question that was asked before, is you should bring ideas because, you know, my definition of snowmass is about you making your future happen, not a bunch of old people telling you what to do. So along those lines, you know, when I was a student or a postdoc, I, I hated these panels and committees because I would sit there and think, who are all these old people? Why, why do I care about what they think? Um, so I've grown up a little bit. And what I think now is that my job is to make sure you have something interesting to do. So, and your job is to help me do that. So, you know, what can you do to get involved? All right, so you can learn things. You can skim or attend some meetings. You know, don't go to every single talk at some workshop, right? Because that's just gonna be, you're not gonna understand anything past the second talk maybe. Uh, but go to the lead off talks, right? Um, or look at them online. You can check out the LOIs, right? So our, our LOIs are here. You can look at them, you can just skim them and go, oh, okay, this is interesting, maybe not. Um, you can add your name, we'll reload it. You can communicate, Snowmass is really good at that. We have infinite numbers of email lists, you know, arbitrary numbers of Slack channels. The one-stop shopping for all this is snowmass21.org um, or the workspace or contact one of us and we'll help. Um, and you can participate, you can get involved right now at the beginning and you'll have more influence later. So, you know, if you had, so none, none of my lame jokes work over Zoom. So, you know, that's supposed to be a joke over here. Um, but if you have, you know, an hour a week, right, what would I do, right? So if I spend more than time on that, you know, my kids don't get that, my supervisor will come after me and so somebody else is gonna get that job. So what do you do with your hour or so a week? Well. You know, the first thing I would do is I would skim the LOIs. But I'd sort of look over them and go, okay, you know, what sparks my imagination here? What's interesting? As I said before, you can attend kickoff talks at, at Frontier Workshops. Um, and so look at the calendars and go, okay, I don't know anything about this. There's a, there's a workshop. Um, let me take 20 minutes and go to the kickoff. Or look at it on later on Indico. Uh, a lot of these things are recorded now. So you can look at the recording, um, but really not just what you do, because you don't need to go to a workshop on something you do. You're just going to hear the same talks you hear all the time, right? So find something you don't know anything about and learn about it, okay? And that's a great way to get your hour a week. Okay, so questions. Um, maybe I should wait on questions or we should wait on questions until Josh talks. So Josh, I will stop sharing and all yours. Sure. Okay, just to continue where Bob left off really quick, just to finish up the hour here, uh, I just wanted to update everyone on the current Snowmaster Early Career Leadership within the Rare Processes Frontier, and also just make another call for involvement. I'll start out with just a, a quick overview again of what Bob introduced us to within the Rare Processes Frontier. Uh, which is what it is that we actually do. Um, my personal interpretation of this is that we are generally focused on unique and very powerful low energy observables, usually compared to other kinds of large experiments like the LHC, although of course we have the LHCB uh, part of this, but we usually look for low energy observables with high scale implications. And there's two different fronts to this. There's of course the standard model and the beyond standard model front. I'll start with the beyond standard model front where we basically are asking these questions that are kind of fundamental to our existence. And that's what is the matter antimatter asymmetry? Where is flavor violation? And then are there richer, uh, richer kinds of phenomenology of dark matter, entire dark sectors that allow for testable predictions? And then can we have far reaching measurements of really, really powerful observables at this tabletop cheap level for small experiments? 
And then of course we have the known standard model physics where we can search for other things with greater precision. So that's like, as Bob said, the B and C quark, uh, as well as light and strange quarks. And we can also look at quarkonia and so on and so forth at colliders and other places. And we want to encourage early career involvement in these experimental programs, because that is paramount for our collective development and action over the next few years. So please get involved. Uh, those who have already become involved include some of our leadership. And I'll just go over that real quick. That includes me uh, and Jake Bennett, who's an assistant professor at University of Mississippi. And uh, we're the semi-permanent points of contact. We really don't have any kind of formal uh, elected structure just yet. So we're very flexible. We are very much willing to move in and out of le leadership positions, especially with me coming up with a, a defense later next year. So uh, there is definitely motion that can happen from all of you inward. Uh, we have subtopical group liaisons for BNC quarks. We have uh, Jake for RF2 for weak decays. We actually need someone. So if we, if you are interested in this particular uh, sector, we really would like your involvement. As far as uh, small experiments are concerned, we have Mono and myself. Um, I was taking our uh, minutes today, so thank you for that. He's a research associate at Fermilab. And then for Baron and Leptin number violation, uh, that's me uh, focusing on NNBAR. And then as far as charged lepton flavor violation, we have Mono again, and also uh, staff scientists at Berkeley, uh, Richie. So also just joined the particle data group, so congratulations for that. At RF6 for dark sectors, we have our first theorist, thankfully, which is uh, Yudai Sai. He's a postdoc at Fermilab. And then we have Tom Eichler-Smith, who's a PhD student in Minnesota. And then as uh, Bob already mentioned, we have a community engagement uh, frontier liaison with Sophie Middleton. So she's a postdoc at Caltech working on UDE. And then we also need someone for uh, hadron spectroscopy. So again, if you are involved in these uh, measurements and you would like to become a, a leader in this particular sector, please reach out to us or send your recommendations. Uh, as far as our meetings within the SEC part of this, uh, we are planning these roughly monthly, so we probably will have one next week. Uh, that'll be our second one, I think. Our, uh, we have a shared Google Drive where we'll be taking minutes. We'll also probably be trying to put that on DocDB and so on and so forth. Um, and then we also uh, basically want to grow the group and eventually start switching out of roles with people once we have a high enough number, because this is a smaller frontier. So please join us. There's lots of new exciting experiments on the horizon and happening now. So uh, with that, I guess we'll be ready to take questions. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions? So what is the best way to get in touch with the uh, early career happenings? Is it just to go straight to the meetings or do you have a Slack channel? We do have a Slack channel. Uh, it's currently private, but if you reach out to Jake or myself, we're very much willing to add you to that. We also have an open listserv here. And if you just uh, literally just send this uh, email here, um, it'll automatically subscribe you to our mailing list. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions? So maybe if I, I can just clarify yeah. what uh, Joshua said, there's a a private channel that's for the leadership. Uh, there's also the open channel just for uh, Snowmass Young. Yeah, yeah. So it, all of the announcements go there too. Yeah, every every uh, topical group has their own uh, channels that are maintained by the, the leadership and the members. And they're actually nicely labeled. They have RP, F3, or 4, or something like that. Awesome. So seeing no more hands raised. Um... Uh, I, can't, I can't raise my hand as a co-convener. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so with, with limited um, capacity to, to think about it while I was taking minutes, uh, two, two comments and, or two questions to, to Bob uh, on, um, uh, one is you mentioned that, you know, uh, involvement in SNOMAS might seem to some as you know it might set you back career wise as, as others are doing analysis that they will be able to uh leverage into a job or uh be seen as more uh more traditional thing to to get hired on uh but uh understanding of the entire field 
uh, and planning, having a, a research plan and involvement for the future is definitely uh, career wise, is definitely a great thing to have, right? Um, and, um, and I guess as a, uh, as a related question, um, you, you said at the beginning that looking across the entire field and even changing uh, your subfield is something that can, can be looked upon favorably. Um, you know, definitely for, for a Wilson fellow, that is uh, very relevant. And I can definitely understand, you know, how this connects to, to your perspective and the precision frontier, which just uh, in, uh, interlinks everything. And one needs this bigger intellectual picture to, to bring it all together and understand the complementarities. Um, but, you know, um, and other than for, for your first postdoc, this is a great uh, place to do that, uh, great time to do that and change subfield. But as you go to the junior scientist level, uh, how how feasible is that to you know uh, to uh, move into a new field? Uh, and uh, I guess the snow mess um, is is a great opportunity for that to to see what might be a good connection or a good um, place to connect your existing skills as uh, to find something that interests you. Sure. Sorry for the so, general question. Yeah. So. You know, I'm not at your career stage right now, but I will give you a little, maybe a little bit of my personal history and um, some other examples of people I know who have done things like what I did. So, you know, I got into my thesis because, you know, I just, that, that was where I ended up. Um, I'm very happy with it doing CP violation in neutral case. So that super precise experiment. And then I said, I never want to do a super precise experiment again. I want to do something really sloppy. And so I ended up doing QCD and neutrinos and deep elastic scattering. And then after maybe five or six years, 10 years of that almost, um, I found the one really nice thing that I could do that was precise because I got tired of doing messy things like QCD and um, I was the spokesperson for NUTEV, which is a, which was a measurement of the weak mixing angle in neutrino scattering. Um, and then you know, we did that measurement and then the field moved to neutrino oscillations. And I said, okay, well, I'll do neutrino oscillations now. So I did that with MINOS and NOVA. And after 25 years of being in neutrinos, I said, I don't wanna do neutrinos anymore. I wanna change something else. So I was, I was almost about to join DES. Um, and then somebody told me about Muta E, and they actually asked me to be spokesperson. Um, and I said, well, I don't know anything about this experiment. It's really important physics and it's terrifically hard, sure. Um, so I've actually changed, that was in 2006, I think. So I've actually changed subfields like four times. And my experience is about a year or so, you don't know anything. Um, and then you know a lot more than you did before because you, you bring in the techniques you learned in other parts. And so I've changed fields at every career stage. Um, when CDF and D0 shut down, a lot of people went to DES. So if you know Brenna Floir, right, she was, she was big in, in CDF for a long, long time. Um, Sam Zeller and, and Bonnie Fleming were on NUTEP. Yeah, they're still doing neutrino oscillations but they were doing deep elastic scattering with me back in the 90s. Um, so, you know, I, can, I can't tell you what it's like today, but, you know, you can, I could just go on and on and on about people who have changed subfields, right? And usually everybody start for smart people who want to work, right? So if you find something that's interesting to you, you know, I would, I would recommend taking a look at it. Don't, don't be afraid that you're not going to be able to make that step. I think, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, sure. Awesome. So thank you to both speakers uh, and all of the people who asked questions. Finally, we're going to hear from the theory frontier, which is represented by Samuel Hanor. Sam is a postdoc at Harvard University, having received his PhD from Stony Brook University in 2020. 
He's a theoretical particle physicist with interest in the Higgs boson and dark matter. Dr. Hummeler for the Theory Frontier. All right, uh, so hopefully you guys can hear me now. Um, yeah, so this is on behalf of the Theory Frontier and, and the rest of the, the SEC Theory Frontier leadership, uh, Seth Corrin, Shobit Kumar, and Robert McGeehee. Uh, okay. Um, so first, just, just a quick overview. So the Theory Frontier is, is completely uh, new this year, actually. This is the first time we've had a Theory Frontier in Snowmass. Um, and so I think it's kind of useful just to, to kind of lay out what, what the broad goals of it are and, and what, it's, uh, what the scope of, of the Theory Frontier is. And so, so very broadly, you know, the goal is to kind of, you know, just uh, highlight all of the different, you know, kind of recent advances and, and things going on in theoretical physics. Um, you know, both for, for theory that's, that's directly applicable to, to all of the other frontiers, um, but then also, you know, some, some stuff that's just kind of uh, interesting in, in its own right, right, and may not have some, some kind of direct uh, tie to some particular project that, that's being advocated in Snowmass. Um, so we kicked off on, on July 30th. Uh, you, can, you can see the, the minutes here. Um, and there were also kickoff meetings for all of the different topical groups there that'll have more information that, that I can't cover over here. Um, and these are the three conveners, uh, Nathaniel Craig, Chapatsky, and uh, Aida Okadra. All right, um, so the Theory Frontier, its, its goals are really, really broad in, in what it's trying to cover, and so there's, there's correspondingly a lot of different topical groups. Um, so there's 11 different topical groups uh, that I'm just showing here. Um, and the, what I wanna, want you to take away from this slide, just seeing all of these, is that you know you can kind of if you look at these immediately you'll notice that a lot of these uh, different topical groups do have direct connections to to particular experiments or the other frontiers um, and I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit more in a bit um, but a lot of them also have have uh, aspects that are really more formal uh, and have had lots of recent developments in the last 20 years and stuff like that um, you know that may may not tie to, to some of the other frontiers directly and so that's kind of the goal is to highlight you know, all of the different interconnections between all of these different topical groups um, and, and how these things are, are interesting in their own right. All right, um, so in the interest of, of not being biased towards any particular topical group, I'm gonna very quickly run through them. Uh, so the first is string theory, quantum gravity, and black holes. And so this is, you know, all the kinds of, trying to highlight all of the developments, not only from, you know, string theory as kind of a fundamental description, but all of the other things that have kind of come out of studying it, things like the ADS-CFT correspondence, um, you know, connections to mathematics, uh, you know, other things we've learned about many body quantum systems and stuff like that. Um, TFO2 is effective field theory techniques. And so this is a great example of some of one of the topical groups that has, you know, very tight connections. Um, part, parts of it are very tightly connected to things that are happening at, say, the energy frontier, right? Uh, things like uh, soft collinear effective field theory, SMEF, these are, you know, very well covered in some of the other frontiers too, um, but there's also more formal aspects that are covered by TFO2, things like the swampland or weak gravity conjectures and stuff like this. Uh, TFO3 um, is conformal field theories and formal QFTs. Uh, so this is just kind of, you know, all of the different results we have about studying quantum field theories in their own right. Um, so conformal field theories, you know, uh, different uh, SUSY theories in different dimensions where we can get kind of exact results and and learn interesting things about the quantum field theories, uh, topological QFTs, and then the connections between these and, and some other subfields. TFO4 is scattering amplitudes. So that's yet another one of these examples where you know, these scattering amplitudes, of course, are, are vital in, in collider physics. And there's been lots of work on that and doing these calculations more efficiently uh, in the past couple decades. Um, but there's also very formal connections as well, uh, studying you know, the mathematical structures, things like the amplitudehedron that show up from stuff like this. Uh, lattice gauge theory, um, you know, is again, you know, kind of you can study um, advances in lattice gauge theory in its own right and things you can learn about quantum field theory, but it's also important input for, for uh, things like quark and lepton flavor physics. Uh, it's very important for neutrino physics, all of these different things too. And there's been, uh, you know, the goal is to highlight the, the theory advances there. Um, so the next couple are, are even more kind of closely uh, tied to, to some of the other frontiers. Uh, so TFO06 is theory techniques for precision physics. Um, so this is precision physics, not only necessarily in things like flavor physics or CP violation, but also kind of, you know, trying to get really precision physics at the energy frontier too, right? Uh, so calculations, you know, at higher and higher loop order um, 
and then other things that we need to kind of understand better from the theory side in order to, to make really precise measurements in the future. TFO7 is maybe a little bit self-explanatory, collider physics. So this is, you know, sort of just the, the stuff that's parallel to the energy frontier, but completely from the theory perspective and kind of adver advocating for, for, you know, new different kinds of signatures, um, different things that, you know, different advances that we've made in event simulation and defining new observables, all these kinds of things. And so they're, it's very, very tightly tied to, to the energy frontier. Uh, TFO8 is BSM model building. And so this is uh, tied not only to all of the other frontiers to some extent, but also to a lot of the other uh, topical groups within the theory frontier, um, because we're just talking about, you know, models that can try to answer these fundamental questions that we always hear about, uh, things like dark matter, the very symmetry, um, things like this. Uh, TFO9, astro uh, and cosmology, of course, is, is, is kind of just the theory side of, of the uh, cosmic frontier um, and all of the interesting new ideas that have happened there and how it can be connected to some other stuff in the theory frontier too. Um, TF10, quantum information science. So this is, again, one of these things where there's a very formal side of this and these connections um, to entanglement, quantum information, and holography, but then also you know, using uh, advances in quantum information science to as, as sensors and quantum systems um, and, you know, actually kind of applying these ideas on the experimental side as well. And last but certainly not least is the uh, TF11, the theory of neutrino physics. Um, and so this is kind of all of the different theory uh, behind, um, you know, all of the different advances in, in neutrino physics and, and how it's tied to the rest of the theory frontier too. Um, so just in case you're, you're wondering, it's, it's a burning question in your mind who the Conveners are all of these different topical groups have some different conveners. And of course, this is on the SNOMAS website, of course, too. Um, and I'll also just, just say quickly that, you know, the, since the, the theory frontier is so kind of uniquely, I think, tied to all of the other different uh, frontiers, you know, it's really important to have lots of different communication between the theory frontier and the other frontiers. And so there are uh, specified liaisons between the theory frontier and all of the other frontiers as well that are, that are here. And you can also look these up on, on the website. All right, um, so what kinds of things are happening in the theory frontier, at least so far? Um, there's already been a bunch of LOIs that have been submitted, and this is just sort of to give you a sample of, of some things that have, have appeared so far, um, hopefully as unbiased as possible. And so you can see there's, there's lots of these LOIs that were submitted to, to both the theory frontier and one of the other frontiers. So this, you know, things like the cosmic frontier and the theory frontier, the energy frontier, um, quantum information, uh, all of these things, you know, have, are kind of cross-cutting. Um, but there's also been some LOIs submitted specifically to the theory frontier uh, that are sort of just highlighting exactly exactly what uh, what we need from theory in the, in the coming years um, and, and advances that may not be particularly tied to, to one of these other groups. All right. Um, so on the early career side, uh, we're sort of just, uh, we're still kind of in the process of setting up our organization, but the main points of contact I already told you, and here's our emails here. Um, and I just want to kind of come back to this point again. I mentioned this is the first time we've ever had the theory frontier. And so I think it kind of makes it this really unique opportunity for early career people who are interested in theory um, to kind of get involved and, and help define exactly what we want to make of, of the theory frontier, right? Um, you know, what, what kind of things do we want to highlight and do more of? Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, if early career people want to be involved, um, you know, you, you can really, really make a big difference here. And so I've listed, we also have a bunch of people who have signed up to be liaisons to the different topical groups, um, but there's plenty of room for, for more people to join. And of course, you know, if you're interested in being one of the other things, you'll notice that some of these are, are the, you know, we're the main points of contact. So we're happy to, to cede some of the extra space here too. Um, so there's lots of room for other volunteers to, to get involved and kind of help facilitate communication, uh, recruit people, um, get people interested who are interested in writing LOIs to, to talk to the people on the main frontier and, you know, maybe even just self-organize amongst, amongst the early career folks. Uh, and last on this slide, I just want to give a special thanks to Udai, who's um, been really, really crucially involved in, in kind of getting all of this structure uh, organized from the get-go. All right. Um, so how can you participate in the theory frontier? Um, so, of course, this is kind of what was mentioned in the last uh, talk, too. Um, the first thing you can do is, is come to the meetings. So there will be a big theory frontier presence at the community planning meeting. Um, for the particular topical groups, I'll just refer you to their kickoffs or their uh, different Slack channels and stuff like this. They might have other meetings happening in the meantime. Um, but the main theory frontier event that's already been scheduled is, is the big theory frontier conference in March. Um, 
And so it's currently scheduled to be at the KITP. We'll, we'll see what happens uh, come the spring, whether it has to go virtual or not. But this will be the really big uh, event for the theory frontier to kind of, you know, finish defining what, what we're hoping to accomplish um, and then get ready for, for the final summer studies next summer. Uh, and then of course that's, that's next July. Um, so the other thing of course you can do in the meantime is, is uh, write letters of interest and, and contribute papers. Um, and here just a special note that LOIs that are specifically for the theory frontier, since it got started a little bit later and its needs are a little bit different than some of the other frontiers, um, you know, they do not have this August 31st deadline. So if you're interested in something in theory and you want to write an LOI, uh, you've been putting it off or something, you do not need to scramble in the next eight or nine days to try and finish this up. Um, you're still welcome to, to reach out to other people and try and uh, organize more people to write LOIs. Um, and we really encourage you to do that. Uh, the one thing I'll note is that, you know, if you want it to be cross-listed with one of the other frontiers, then you might have to consider this deadline a little bit more seriously. Um, but because the theory frontier is kind of figuring out exactly everything that it, it wants to do, uh, we definitely you know, want you to continue to submit LOIs if, if you have them after August 31st. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of transition into to more contributed papers later on. Uh, so certainly reach out to any of the, the contact people that I mentioned um, or, or just message us on Slack uh, by email, whatever works best. Um, and we can help organize you know, contributions for LOIs. So if you're looking for a group of people that you wanna write something uh, but you need, you know, you want to get a kind of broader scope, you need other people to help contribute, um, you know, let us know and we can, if you want us to help uh, seek people out. All right, um, so what's the best way to get involved? Um, so I'll just mention again, you know, this, this is a new frontier, so it needs new ideas. So we really, really do want early career people to, to start signing up in mass. Um, the best way is probably to join us on Slack. I highlighted here SECTH is the, the public Slack channel, so anybody can just jump in there. There's already been a lot of discussions about you know, the best way of organizing things and what we can do going forward, um, and some advertisements for getting people involved in LOIs from, from the get beginning. Um, and so, so everybody should, should jump in there. Uh, the main uh, group for the Theory Frontier, um, you know, that's not just restricted to early career people, is the Theory Frontier Topics group. And then all of the different topical groups, of course, also have their own public Slack channels. Um, I'll also just say, feel free to reach out directly to the conveners or one of the early career liaisons that I gave the emails for. Uh, we're happy to, to get you in touch with, with whoever um, you know, is, is most useful for you. There's a listserv. And, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, you know, if you, there have a couple of the topical groups, um, I didn't go through one by one to figure out which ones have them and which ones don't, did have these Google forms to kind of express interest in, in the particular groups. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in kind of, you know, one of the topical groups in particular, you can uh, go to their kickoff meeting slides. You can find these Google Forms and, and let them know that, that you're interested. Um, and if you can't find one, if they don't have one, you can reach out to the conveners if you're having trouble finding it or if you think that they should, should make one because they haven't yet. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the best thing. Um, really, really hope that some of you will get involved and let us know the best way that we can uh, help uh, advance all of your ideas in, in theory. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sam. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I can start us off. Um, so when you were going over the different topical groups, I noticed that there is a topical group for the for cosmic theory, and then there's also a topical group for neutrinos. Uh, but in the description for the neutrinos one, there was mention of like cosmic neutrinos. So can you explain how those separate out? Um, I mean, to some extent, I'm not sure that they, they do separate out. I mean, I guess the, the point is maybe to, to um, I mean, here we're talking about, I guess, astroparticle and cosmology more, more generally, but I mean, really, I guess you, you could cross list it for, for both topical groups, right? If, it, if it's really astrophysics of, of neutrinos in theory, then, then it would go into both. Um, and then maybe also be cross listed with some of the, the topical groups in the neutrino frontier as well. Um, so hopefully that, that answers that question. Yeah, thanks. And TF11 yeah. actually came out of the neutrino frontier, correct? So. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so it's, it's the TF11 people are, are very, very much in touch with, with the neutrino frontier. Uh, so it really is sort of just the arm of the neutrino frontier in, in the theory frontier itself. Did anybody else have any questions? Udai is thanking you for the great slides, beautiful slides. Yeah, it's 
greeting today. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> you die, you got a haircut. I, I, <laughs> that is I, worth I, applause. I, my partner cut it for me. <laughs> it's, it's not good. It's the best no, way it's to good, it's good. Sorry, it's good. <laughs> So I, I did have a, a kind of, I guess, general question. Um, and you, you may know or not know, but with a lot of the LOIs that I'm developing currently uh, for the rare processes frontier particularly, there is a significant amount of theoretical background that is introduced with many of those LOIs that may be of interest to the theory frontier. Um, are you guys actually interested in those kinds of things where we just talk about theory for a paragraph or two and then the rest of it is experiment? Or are you guys really interested in the hard hitting theory particularly where we are just proposing ideas and advocating for more investigation into different channels? Um. I mean, I would say, I think Chab is also here, maybe he can answer the question in, in case he disagrees, but I would say that if there is something that's, um, you know, where, where you are calling for something that is very theory related, something, some new development in theory or something that has to be done on the theory side, then I would think that that definitely needs to be, that would be great to have that involved in, in the theory frontier too. Um, you know, maybe if it's something where the theory has been understood completely for 20 or 30 years and, you know, you're just applying new searches to it, um, something, maybe, maybe it's less important. Uh, but if there is kind of a bit an advance in, in theory, then that, um, then certainly I think it would be interesting to the theory frontier too. Yes, exactly, perfect answer. Good. So for instance, like if, if there are papers which have come out in the recent, like in the last year that have made very interesting transformations in the field, having something related to that may be of interest, just in case like the information hasn't percolated down completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, would, I would say so for sure. Awesome, does anybody else have any questions? All right, not seeing any hands. I want to thank everyone for being in attendance and I want to thank all of our speakers again. Um, all of these meetings were recorded and will be hosted on the Indico page. So if you have any friends that missed any of the frontiers they were interested in, feel free to point them there. <laughs>